KPFA Apprenticeship Program. We're your hosts, Daishi and Irene. Tonight we have a full show of comedy. We have in the studio tonight, Killing My Lobster, comedian Caitlin Gill, comedian Edwin Okongo, a piece on Animals and Laughter by Felix, a piece on Prescott Theater, Circus Theater by Sam, The Joy of Laughter by Frank. And we also have a few clips of our favorite nationally renowned comedian, comedians. Why is it important to keep on laughing? So you keep your sanity, I guess. If you don't laugh, you'll go crazy, I think. I don't know. It's joy. Joy is important, yeah? It's important to keep on laughing because if you take life too seriously, you'll go insane. It'd be crazy. You know what I mean? Look, I look at you and I laugh. <laughs> I see the funny in everything. You know? Laughter, laughter is the best medicine in the world, you know? Anybody who doesn't like a comedian, he's got a problem. Because I'm alive today. Can you believe it? I wouldn't have thought this 21 years ago that I'd be alive today and I'd have all these friends. Because it exercises every single muscle in your body, in your face, every muscle in your abs, everything in your body. When you're laughing, everything is moving in your body. Every muscle is being used. I think it's healthy for you and it stimulates your blood and things in your brain and it's for all over it's good health because you start laughing at others and then you can learn you can laugh at yourself too and that's sometimes the funniest stuff of all because when you can laugh at yourself that'll get you laughing the hardest why is it important to keep on laughing part of it is it lightens your heart it makes people around you laugh because it's very contagious and I had a good answer a minute ago. Now stop. <laughs> You're so bad. <laughs> uh, it eases stress. I just like the fact that it makes other people laugh and can change other people's moods too. So therefore, it's got to be better for you medically. Well, I think it's important to keep laughing because it frees your spirit and keeps you from uh, focusing on all the bad stuff that's going on in the world today. Focusing on the positive. Because it, it, it strengthens our heart. You know, it, it releases the endorphins in our head. Man, it, 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 it releases some chemical in our brain. It strengthens our heart. It makes your heart feel good. And it helps us grow, you know. Laughter is the best medicine. For Full Circle, this is Pre Will and Franklin saying keep on laughing. Oh, my God. Thank you, Frank, for that medley. As you know, today is April Fool's Day, and we wanted to celebrate by having this be a show on laughter, humor, and comedy. Yes, yes, thank you, Frank, and many thanks to our wonderful audience, everyone that has joined us tonight. Sunlo. Yeah, that's that. We asked them to make as much noise as possible, so we hope they keep up. Tonight, Sunlo Sauti Sunlo Ongea, the group that I belong to, is bringing you a night of laughter. So we're doing that with some live comedian performances, some clips of our favorite artists, and also some segments created by our own triple SO, that's Sun Lo Sauti, Sun Lo again. And I don't know if any of you listeners know this, but I personally am a very silly, often bizarre person. <laughs> and this show is finally an opportunity for me to let some of that energy out. Having, oops, sorry, <laughs> having said that, um, having little technical difficulties, um, but it's all good. So having said that, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, we kind of wanted to do a little kind of scientific factoidy kind of, kind of explanations around why, what is humor, you know, aside from the fact that obviously there's benefits to laughter and, and stuff like that, but what does humor mean and what is, what are, maybe what's an explanation? And so I was looking online. 
It's like the first thing I found, so it may not be correct, but it might. It's interesting, I thought. So according to this dude, his name is um, Stephen M. Sultanoff. He's a Ph.D., he his interpretation on what humor is is first humor is the experience of incongru uh, incongruity in one's environment the incongru in how do you say that word that word <laughs> incongruity <laughs> okay that's English is my second language so maybe experience um, when someone falls down in a situation when they are not expected to fall down so if someone falls you know whatever like that could be funny um, second. He's saying that humor is an emotional chaos remembered in tranquility. So commonly, it wasn't funny at the time, but later with distance, we can appreciate that there was humor in that situation. Um, third, um, humor can be experienced in the joy of getting it. Like humor can be understood um, as something that we first did not comprehend and then later we, we do. Um, the fourth is the experience of the forbidden. So something when you're you're laughing when you're actually not supposed to laugh. This um, is my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> or the, uh, the the sensation of getting away with something. Um, we often equate laughter with humor, but you do not need to laugh to experience humor. And the more important question instead um, is what is humorous? Um, instead of what is humorous is the question, what do you experience as humorous? So we don't have the clip, or we do have the clip. Great, because this is a really cool clip. All right. So we have this clip by Hari Kondambolu, is an American stand-up comic who managed to respectfully poke fun at the social issues such as poverty, racism, and a rejection of Indian stereotypes seen in the media. He regularly comes to San Francisco and Oakland and just had his first Comedy Central show in February. Thanks to V-Star for pulling these clips. So let me talk about something perhaps we can all relate to. Chocolate. Yeah, yeah, we all know or like chocolate, yes? Chocolate. Chocolate is great. I love chocolate. Here's why I love chocolate so much. You see, in this country, a person is assumed to be white unless otherwise specified. That's why I like chocolate. Because when you first think of chocolate, you think of something brown. And if you think of white chocolate first, well, then you're a racist. <laughs> Honestly. Come on. Who's thinking of chocolate in that situation exactly? And here's the bigger question. Why did we need white chocolate to begin with? All right, what was wrong with chocolate? It's chocolate. It's great. Why did we need to make white chocolate? Do you love the taste of chocolate, but can't stand looking at it? <laughs> well, try some white chocolate, huh? It's from the people that brought you white Jesus. <laughs> All right, so that was Hari Kondambolu. Um, his website is H-A-R-I-K-O-N-D-A-B-O-L-U.com. Up next, we join Sam, the Shaolin B-Boy, as he looks for laughter at an elementary school in Oakland. Let's go! You already signed both names. It's 3.30 p.m. in an elementary school in West Oakland. But the sounds that you hear aren't from a regular after-school class. The most noticeable difference is that all of the students are over seven feet tall. Stilting is a very serious thing because we can fall and backwards sometimes. In the cafeteria of Prescott Elementary School, around 15 third, fourth, and fifth graders are practicing traditional African stilt dancing by way of New Orleans. The youth are warming up on their stilts. We have the performance called Higher Ground. It's really about higher ground as a metaphor that you are always seeking the higher ground in you. Striving for higher ground and learning history about cultural arts are integral parts of this unique after-school program. These students are training to be clowns as part of the Prescott Circus Theater. When you say circus, people want to make me think, you know, clowns and makeup and confetti everywhere. To younger children, it brings them happiness. They think it's fun. I took an afternoon to hang out with the Prescott Clowns as they rehearsed for their big show and spoke to a couple of the kids, a couple of the teachers, and this guy. Jamar Woodruff, 
I am the artistic director of Prescott Circus Theater. We take youth circus as a means to teach discipline, self-confidence, focus, all these things under the umbrella of circus. It's a great tool to use because there are very tangible things that you able to do. Like if you're trying to juggle, you can really see when you go from juggling, making one toss to making six tosses. It gives the kids a way to see their progress. I go by Coach Derek, and I'm an artist in residence here at the Prescott Circus Theater program. The Prescott Circus Theater is an institution to help inspire young people through circus arts to not only be creative and master skills that they might not have thought they could do, but also to master life skills. The founder, Eileen Moffitt, she was a school teacher here at Prescott School. She had trained as a clown earlier on before teaching. She started the after school circus program, it was a juggling program, and that was 25 or 26 years ago. Out of that, each year she started adding another circus component gymnastics, partner acrobatics, glow, stilt walk, traditional African stilt dancing with drumming, unicycle juggling, hip hop dance. We have a tight wire that we use. Cam bone body percussion. She saw how through kinesthetics using the body can also help the children with their studies in school. In the Prescott Circus Theater, we have what we call graduate clowns who have been in the program at least one year. They get the leadership. They're the ones who we expect to show and demonstrate through their behavior of what leadership looks like. It looks like big church pants, colorful, green shirts, suspenders that are all white and no, black no. dots. What Coach Derek is really talking about is members of the Prescott Circus have the opportunity to go out and teach their clown skills to other kids around Oakland. I talked to... Chocolate Drop. And... Jerry. About what this was like. It's a good way to interact with other kids at different schools. I was surprised what they were doing. A person who already knew how to juggle, he did elevator, he did under the leg, he did everything. And I wanted to try to work with him. It's fun teaching and it's like kids that really, really do learn fast. Artistic director Jamar Woodruff. Kids receive it better coming from a peer. When they see the other kids doing and the other kids telling them, it makes it attainable to them. Coming from me, an adult, oh, of course you're an adult, you can do it. But, oh, this kid that's my age, they can do it, and they're giving me tips, so it must be true. Coach Derek. Other graduates who've gone on, who are maybe four or five, six years older than these kids that are high school students, who've come back, and even to the program, even today, I, there's two that are here who are young adults in college, and they're working with us now. My name is Sierra Walton, and I'm a class assistant for Prescott Circus Theater. My name is Dimar Solofunas, and I've been in the Prescott Circus Theater for 10 years. I was once a tall child on stilts, so it's kind of... Um, good and fun to come back and work with the kids on something that I used to do. I didn't see nothing like this when I was in third grade and then like fourth grade I was like, what? They have like a circus program for kids? I asked my mom, I was like, can I get in this program? I thought it was going to be so fun. I got in. It was so hard. We had, we had to work out and oh my God, stretch and whew. I never thought that I would be able to juggle and to stilt walk and to tie wire. I never thought that I would be able to do those type of things and Ms. Moffin and other artists that she brought in showed me that I could do these things if I just tried and worked hard at it and kept practicing at it, that I can do what I set my mind out to do. The kids get more inspired by the adults telling them, you can do it, you can do it. The young kids don't, don't really have people to tell them that, like, you can do this, you can do this in life, you can do this in life. And that's one of the reasons why I came back, because these adults encouraged me, and so I felt if some of the kids, like, they don't get it, I, sh I should be able to, to help encourage uh, these young ones to come up, and maybe they, they, they will come back sometime and then encourage some more students. I used to be shy. I didn't used to be outgoing, but that kind of broke me out of my shell coming be part of this program. You must be funny. You must have energy. You must. Did I mention be funny? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So what do these clowns think the ultimate lesson of the Prescott Circus Theater is?
I think they're trying to teach us to be mature at a time and to be silly at a time. Never giving up on what I do because as I get older, it's different stuff in the future. If I didn't go to this program, I would I, I think I would have gave up. In my position right now, I think I would have gave up. Maybe sometimes it's, we just need to have a happy time to make yourself feel better. That they'll be able to not be afraid to, you know, be great. <laughs> I just to point out. There's something to be said about laughing at me and laughing with me. The clown's job is to spoof life and laugh at itself, but also at the same time demonstrating skill with that laughter. Laughter feeds the soul, and it is just something that gives you that chance to release. Throughout history, the clown has been that safety valve for the world, from the court jesters, even back to the pharaohs of Egypt. That's the role of the clown is to bring levity and that no matter what's going on, you can still have joy in spite of. once in a while if you just smile you know you live longer really the laughter is just like you know what I'm saying the laughter from a child is just is, is amazing this program just it just brings out the laughter brings out the life just to hear a kid laugh you know and to know what they're going through in this surrounding it's like you know why are you laughing and you're, you're in this environment it's like because we have this for full circle This is Sam the Shaolin B-Boy. Oh, yep. We're here to do the clowns here. Okay. So you are listening to Full Circle on KPFA 94.1 FM. Thanks, Sam, for that piece. If you're interested in seeing the Prescott Circus Theater, tomorrow is your chance. We're, we're going to tell you more about that at the end of the show, however. All right, and now it's time for for a joke that I've gotten. If you don't like the joke, you can f- please do call in. Let folks know I will not be answering the phone, so it does not matter if you do not like it and call in. Um, just to give you some background on the process that went into tonight, we had a number of very tough sessions with our group where we gauged each other's humor and ability to make others laugh. After a number of grueling sessions, fortunately, we found that I was the only person available to co-host with Taishi today. (laughs) Inside joke. (laughs) Okay, good, good. But seriously, there are many benefits to humor and laughter. And this is one of the reasons why Taishi and I were so excited to bring you all the show. Uh, When we talk about humor and laughter, we're really, or I really am talking about humor, mirth, that positive emotion that comes along with humor and laughter. The magic trio, they say this trio helps people with diabetes, that it keeps cancer at bay, and that it can even make you more attractive to the one whose attention you're trying to attract, even if that person does not necessarily think you are so trustworthy or so intelligent. So, you know, not so bad for those for that magic trio. Keep on laughing. <laughs> and studies have shown that laughing can cause a drop in the blood's concentration of the stress hormone cortisol, which is very, very important. And they also say that a humorous perspective can help you create a cognitive distance between some of the disappointments in life, such as a job loss and a love loss, both also very important in today's today's world. So to give you some dose of that goodness provided by laughter, up next we have another clip by Hadi. This is my favorite. I was at this party last week, and this guy came up to me, and he's like, hey, man, where are you from? So, so I told him, I'm from Queens, New York. Yeah. But wait, but wait. And then he's like, no, I mean, where are you really from? Which, for those of you who don't know, that's code for, no, I mean, why aren't you white? Um, I noticed your skin was a different color than mine. Why? Why this? Why? Pick, pick 
Esmond, big, why Esmond? Why, why this? What kind of animal are you? And um, I was I was offended clearly, and. Uh, I was offended because this man had judged me based on the color of my skin and not by my more important qualities, which of course are the softness and smoothness of my skin. <laughs> Traits I have carefully cultivated with the extensive use of cocoa butter. <laughs> yes, Hari Kondabolu uses cocoa butter. Just the other day I went to the supermarket to get some more cocoa butter when I noticed the cocoa butter had been moved to the ethnic needs section of my supermarket. And at first I was happy. I'm like, ethnic needs, end of police brutality, more access to health care, more educational opportunities. Finally, no, no. Just hair relaxers and cocoa butter, apparently. You are listening to Full Circle on KPFA 94.1. Again, that was Hari Kondabolu. Up next, Felix brings us a piece on animals and laughter. So what's the deal with animals and laughter? Remember back to when you were a child, engaged in a thrilling game of chase or tag with your playmates? Recall the moments in play that were accompanied by uncontrollable laughter and giggling as you chased one another through fantastically imagined landscapes and scenarios. This dynamic between laughter and play and tickling is an ancient one, closely linked in our brains. And we acquire the ability to experience this associative social tool before we even learn to speak. And this observation has finally prompted modern science to ask the question, do animals other than ourselves laugh? I'd like to add as an aside that we hold as humans a ridiculous and pretentiously superior view of ourselves over other species and we repeatedly diminish the value and the complexity of their experiences as living beings. That said, recently ongoing research and studies at the beginning of the millennium on rats, monkeys, apes, and dogs have affirmed what I already personally suspected. Now I bet you're wondering what these other mammalian laughs could sound like and what's so funny for these other beasts. Let's have a listen and find out. First up, an animal that's been a vermin, a house pet, and one of our favorite scientific guinea pigs, the rat. Scientists use special tools to pick up the high-frequency chirps that rats make when tickled and when young rats engage in play. And apparently, rats really like being tickled and will come back for more time and time again. Our closer primate relatives have varying laughs that sound somewhat like human laughs and giggles, and they come out during play and through tickling. The panting behavior of dogs during play chasing is another instance of animal laughter. And this next clip is a dog in his dream chasing who knows what, though we can imagine. In all, our compatriots of other species have partaken of laughter in an association with play for eons before we humans even entered the scene. And so maybe now it's time for us to take a tip on humor from them and learn something new about our world. Happy April Fool. Thank you, thank you, Felix, and thank you, audience, for the applause. I agree, that was a fun segment. So we are well into our show, so now might be a good time for me to break out another joke. Ha, ha, ha. All right, right. I have a a joke, Daishi, maybe you can help me with. So I want to share with you a situational joke that is appropriate appropriate for the KPFA audience. (laughs) (laughs) silence (laughs) I like it (laughs) 
Okay, but seriously, so one of my favorite jokes is Chris Rock talking about why marriage is so tough. And I actually practiced this at home quite a few times, and every single time it dropped, just painfully dropped. So right now I'm just going to say you should look it up because it's a good one. And instead, we'll play (laughs) Marga Gomez talking about her volunteer work on the No on 8 campaign. Yeah, I did, I did the phone bank. They gave me a script. And uh, I was very excited because, uh, you know, I'm an actress, and so what a script. <laughs> That's my motivation. <laughs> I kind of overdid it. Um, but uh, basically, you're supposed to stick to the script. You're not supposed to uh, just make things up, go on the fly, go rogue. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> the script. They figured it out for you. And, um, and you're supposed to answer pe- you know, the most frequently uh, mentioned misconceptions. And then you just refer to the script. Like often, the first one we've been talking about is people I talk to would say, oh, but if same-sex marriage passes, then it'll, they'll teach it in the schools. And then I go to the script and I say, same-sex marriage has nothing to do with schools. Oh, but there'll be more activist judges. And I'll say, ah, same-sex marriage has nothing to do with activist judges. (laughs) If there's same-sex marriage, men will have sex with men and women will have sex with women. Same-sex marriage has nothing to do with sex. (laughs) It's marriage. Ask anybody who's married. All right. Well, those of you in the audience have waited long, long enough to hear the live comedy show. So, okay, yes, I'm really, we're really excited about this part. Um, as Elena was saying, we we talked a lot about this during the editorial meeting, and so we're really, really happy to bring up um, our first guest of the night, Caitlin Gill. Caitlin, <laughs> yep. yeah, yeah, Caitlin. <laughs> You want me to do a little bio? Yeah, sure. All right. <laughs> we'll let them know who you are. All right. Tell them who I am. So, Caitlin has played the top comedy venues in the Bay Area and beyond, everything from Vancouver Global Comedy Fest to a few places in, this, in the San Francisco Tenderloin. They used to be comedy clubs, but are now abandoned buildings. <laughs> her style twists her personal experiences into comedy confessions that will leave you red in the face, probably from laughter. Caitlin Gill. Hey, everybody. What's up, KPFA? How is everyone tonight? You feeling good? You feeling good? Give it up for our hostesses, the fabulous ones tonight. You know, ladies, when you opened the show, you were talking about what what humor is and why we laugh. And it got me thinking, because as a comedian, I laugh all the time, but I hear so much comedy, so much scripted comedy. I spend a lot of my day watching people trying to make me laugh. So honestly, the things that make me laugh the hardest now aren't ever planned. They're usually accidents that happen to someone else. (laughs) Those are generally my favorite things to laugh at. Uh, And I definitely laugh a lot when I'm not not supposed to laugh. Uh, It reminded me this happened within the last 24 hours for true. Uh, I was having coffee at a coffee shop. I was on my own sitting at a table and there was a gentleman at another table right next to me also enjoying a cup of coffee. And we two patrons of the coffee shop looked up at about the same time and we made some pleasant eye contact. But in that instant, both our faces got this real surprised expression on it. Because he had just audibly farted. Like, while I was looking deep into his eyes. Uh, and it, it took him su- by surprise. He didn't know it was going to happen. Uh, he got this real shocked look and then just went right back into his newspaper. And I got this real shocked look and then went right back into my notebook. Uh, the only thing I did right was not laugh out loud. But that came at a great physical cost. Uh, I was basically just holding my hand over my face, shuddering over my coffee cup as my body convulsed with involuntary laughter. Tears streamed out of my squeezed shut eyes. And not a word had passed between this man and I. There was no excuse me. There was no, oh, that's fine. It happens to everybody. There's just a silent man red in the face from farting and a woman shuddering with laughter and crying next to him. And the longer it goes on, 
the more I can't stop laughing. Like the, the situation I'm in just gets funnier and funnier to me as I repress the laughter. I can't, I can't possibly look at this man or I'm going to make the whole cafe lose it. I felt, I felt really bad for the guy. He'd walked into a trap. Anyone else would have been able to laugh a little bit and move on. But a professional comedian cannot laugh a little bit at an accidental fart. Uh, I'm going to lose my mind. Uh, and I did. It was pretty great. Uh, I, I came to Berkeley from San Francisco today. Are you all from Berkeley? Is there anybody hang out in the city? Yeah, San Francisco people? No? All right. I assume that some of the radio listening audience would be cheering in their car right now. Uh, well, they know, uh, San Francisco people listening to KPFA, know that it's a very expensive town. Uh, I like it very much. I used to live there. I just moved to Oakland. Yeah. I did it for the same reason that everybody else who looks like me moved to Oakland. Because uh, San Francisco was just too expensive. Uh, so I live in Oakland now. I was actually really excited to move to Oakland. Uh, so excited I didn't wait to check out my apartment building. Uh, I went to look at the Google satellite view because I was so excited about my apartment. And it's adorable, cute windows, nice brick. It was a lovely picture. Uh, in the Google satellite view, uh, there was a police helicopter visible. Well, I'm going to assume that's just coincidence uh, or that I'd be safer because it was there. Uh, neither of those things are true. Uh, there's helicopters there all the time, and I'm never safer because the cops are around in Oakland. Uh, I really like it. I do miss San Francisco, though. It's a city I love very much, but it was too expensive for me. I actually spent a little bit of my time in San Francisco <laughs> between apartments, uh, which is a, a fancy white way of saying homeless. <laughs> Uh, so I lived for a little while downtown in a hostel. If you don't know how a hostel works, here's the deal. You have your own bedroom that's private, but you share a kitchen and a bathroom, which meant that while I was showering, I could see other people's product. I looked up one day, and I saw a bottle of shampoo with a price tag on it that read $28. It was $28. <laughs> Who spends $28 on hair care while they're living in a hostel? <laughs> I'm kind of a country mouse, everybody. It took me a few showers to realize it's called shoplifting. <laughs> and it happens. So when I finally got to move, uh, I stole it. <laughs> oh, I'm still broke, but my hair looks fabulous. <laughs> I just had a birthday. Give it up for me, my birthday. It was kind of a big birthday. I'm not old. I'm not old, but I'm very aware of my age. Um, I, I did a little comfort shopping, and I got myself uh, a new product, something new to me. Uh, the kind of makeup that goes on underneath other kinds of makeup. Uh, that was a retail revolution for me. These are problems I didn't want to admit that I had, really, were the kind of problems that things that worth, with words like shadow on it can fix. Never mind. I'm going to indulge my personal crisis on my own. How about I leave by telling you a little something more about myself? I only have another minute to share with you. You've been fabulous. Have you had a lot of fun? All right, good. Here's the thing. I'm not a very religious person. I'm a huge evolution fan. I'm all about evolution. I think it's really obvious. There's one tree of life, and we all came from it. We're just hanging out on one branch next to a bunch of other twigs. We got relatives out there in the animal kingdom. We heard some of them laughing earlier. We got relatives. You know, some of them were a lot like the chimpanzee, right? You know, chimpanzees, adorable in movies. In nature, jerks. Chimps are mean. They go around beating up other chimp groups. They live in these horrible patriarchal societies. They're violent. They beat each other up and they eat each other's babies. They're awful. We're also a lot like the bonobo. If you don't know about the bonobo, they are pretty awesome. The bonobos, they hang out together in matriarchal societies. They never fight. They always do it. That's all bonobos do. Bonobos do it so much. No daddy bonobo knows which baby bonobo is his. So he raises each of them like they were his own. Pretty sweet, right? I'm a bonobo. <laughs> With chimp rising. Which means I might attack you, but it's just so we can do it. And then I really hope somebody's around to raise these babies. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night.
Caitlin Gill, thank you so much. That was, I laughed a lot. I, I may have cried a little. Um, where can people see you, Caitlin? Oh, people can see me uh, at the Punchline in Sacramento, April 21st to the 23rd. And then I'll be back Memorial Day weekend in San Francisco at the San Francisco Punchline with Nick Griffin. Uh, come check that out. And this Monday in Berkeley at Marga's Funny Mondays at the Marsh. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Give her a round. Just want to give a quick thanks to Caitlin and to Alicia Albaran of Cobb's Comedy Club for connecting us. So we want to let folks know that if they want to get their comedy on, they can visit Cobb's Comedy Club at 915 Columbus Avenue SF and get further information about upcoming events at CobbsComedy.com. All right. So in case you just tuned in, this is Full Circle on KPFA 94.1, and we are bringing you live comedy. You just heard Caitlin Gill. Thank you, Caitlin. And up next, we've got a clip of Mr. Reggie Watts and his song, Big Ass Purse. I was there, you got a big ass purse. What the hell's up with that big ass purse? I'm wondering what's inside that big ass purse. Take a guess if another person saw that big ass purse. Maybe there's another person inside of the other purse. In case you forget what it looks like. You've got your eyes shut up. You've got your eyes shut up. The applicator stick isn't even there anymore. So why the hell you got in the purse? And baby, you look at me with those beautiful brown, blue, black eyes. Yes, you do. You tell me like I'm an idiot, like I'm an idiot. You tell me. Say, why the hell you need an extra mirror? Yeah. And you look at me and you say, maybe you're out on the town and you, you go into the bathroom with a girlfriend, but the girlfriend she only has a clutch because she's smart for only bringing a clutch. But you have your big, big, big ass bag in the bathroom and you reach in and pull out an extra mirror because the bathroom doesn't have a functioning mirror and there's too many girls. The little tiny crack of a mirror that works in the first place And then you're doing two things at once So you're hoping to dispel the stereotype of women Taking too long in the bathroom Cause they're doubling up their time Now who's the idiot this time? All right <laughs> That was I love that song <laughs> Oh, my God. Yay, the studio audience liked Yay. it. So that was uh, Reggie Watts with Big Ass Purse. Um, <laughs> obviously, ladies, some dudes are not filling your ginormous purses, so watch out <laughs> for that. <laughs> Uh, so up next in the studio, we have Killing My Lobster. They're going to um, do some sketches, some comedy sketches from us, for, for, for us. <laughs> um, the, I'm going to give a little intro. So um, Killing My Lobster provides artists with the opportunity to generate and produce performance arts across a range of disciplines that provokes, amuses, educates, entertains, and inspires. All right. Killing My Lobster. Dan, Melissa, I have something very important to tell you. Is something wrong, John? Yeah, whatever it is, we're here for you, buddy. Oh, no, nothing's wrong. I've, just, I've decided I'd, I don't want to use my smartphone anymore. Uh, 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 oh. <laughs> Why is that, John? I feel like I just want to get off the grid for a while. You know, my phone's been sort of dominating my life recently, what with all the text messages and emails I've been getting. I, just, I don't feel like I actually get any real calls anymore. <laughs> text messages and emails are important parts of life, John. Um, I know. I just, I guess I just, I just want to come up for air, you know? I don't believe this. Take it easy, Dan. Guys, come on. <laughs> uh, look. 
You're so selfish. How are we supposed to contact you when you're five minutes late to meet us? Uh, how are we supposed to let you know when we're going to be five minutes late? Dan has a point. Well, I thought we could just wait the extra five minutes. Oh, are you serious, guy? Is this guy serious? You're not making a lot of sense, John. We need to be able to contact each other if we're five minutes late or if we're five minutes early. Oh, see, I had a thought about that. I mean, if we're five minutes early, why is it even necessary to tell the other person about it? Why not just, you know, simply wait until they turn up at the time you all agreed upon, right? Oh, man, I, I am going to hit this guy. John, that is really unforgivable what you just said. Look. You're never on Facebook anymore. You rarely log on to Google Talk. And now this? <laughs> You're messing everything up, dude. We need to be able to track you at all times of the day, John. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm just, I'm just tired of it all, you know? Well, everybody's tired. You think you're alone in this? John, don't do something you'll regret. No. No, I've made up my mind. I am going back to using a landline. <gasps> uh, uh. uh. <laughs> A landline? <laughs> it's, it's too freaking late. This guy is dead to us. Yeah, I agree. I'm sorry, John. If you're going back to using a landline, we'll have to disown you. Okay, Mom. Now, now get on up to bed. It's your first day in school tomorrow. Okay, Dad. <laughs> Man, he's getting big. Yeah, he is getting big. Thank you, Killing My Lobster. <laughs> landline. So how many of you in the audience could relate to that sketch? Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Who has a landline, though? Who has a landline? Anybody? No. Oh, oh, we, got we, got three. Three. we got three people. Okay. Three. Four landlines. Four out of a million. We, <laughs> <laughs> we do. We have a lot of people here. Uh, um, so this sketch was from Killing My Lobster Reboots, and I really want to read the tagline, so I think it's very funny. Comedic vignettes for the technologically titillated. That's right. Very well written. <laughs> Either way. Um, Just come. Just come. <laughs> if you want to hear more um, stuff by Killing My Lobster, visit them at www.killingmylobster.com, spelled the way that it sounds. <laughs> Before we bring up our next comedian, um, we're going to listen to a little clip from Aya de Leon, writer, performer, hip-hop theater artist, poetic activist, and community healer that lives right here in Oakland. And we'll give you some info on where you can see Killing My Lobster at the end of the show. Great. Thank you. I love sensitive guys. You know, guys who go see chick flicks, get depressed about the state of the world, and didn't get laid much in high school. And not just because they're grateful when you go out with them, get a clue, people. Sensitive guys are sexy. Of course, ten years ago, I used to like emotionally monochromatic, sexually aggressive bad boy types. But that's just because I hadn't had any therapy yet. Now... Now I am clear that men can commit no act of rebellion as daring as crying. And you gotta be one tough mugger to hold on to your sensitivity through this hazing from hell called growing up male in America with very few role models, I might add, which is why I'm gonna save up my money and start a cable TV network, The Sensitive Guy Channel. All sensitive guys all the time. Yes. Yes, there will be cop shows. But the star will realize he hates being a cop. And he'll go off to follow his true calling, to be an artist, veterinarian, or preschool teacher. Yeah. There'll be daytime soap operas. And they'll be different. They'll have both gay and straight couples. My network will fight stereotypes. Not all sensitive guys are gay. And not all gay guys are sensitive. There'll be a high school show called Sensitive Guys from South Central. <laughs> and they'll have sensitive guy gangs walking around talking about where my sensitive niggas at. And they'll have sensitive guy gang signs like. There'll also be a 
music show. You know you gotta have a music show. And the most requested video will be the one with the hip hop MC sensitive black guy. And he'll be wearing sweats and sneakers from a garage sale. No gold whatsoever. And he'll be driving down the street in his mother's jacked up 1982 Nissan Sentra. And he'll be rapping about social and political issues to the beat of the AM only radio. And following him down the street will be this pack of supermodels, all hot to get him in bed. Towards the end of the video, Tyra Banks will finally corner him. And he'll tell her, very sensitively, of course, that, uh, yo, Tyra, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you seem like a very nice person. Well, I don't know you. I'm saying... I would need some time, see what I'm saying, to build up the intimacy between us, which I ain't really available for because, yo, I got a girlfriend, ma. She's like a brainy girl with glasses. She outweighs all y'all supermodels by at least 50 pounds. Yo, 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 I'm, I'm madly in love with this girl. I'm mad committed to that relationship. Of course, on the TV show, I would play the girlfriend. And finally, on the Sensitive Guy channel, there will be news shows, and none of the anchors will be choking on a suit and a tie, and they will report how many boys get sexually abused, and how many boys get beaten, and how many boys get bullied like their fathers. Whoa. And suddenly, hearing all that, Men's behavior in the news and all the other networks will start to make sense. But until I can raise the money for my network, I'm going to go around reading this poem, telling the world that I love sensitive guys, which is really to say that I love all guys, because even those emotionally monochromatic, sexually aggressive bad boy types are really sensitive guys. Waiting to happen as soon as we make this society kind enough to, for men to really be themselves. That was Aya de Leon with Sensitive Guys. She was voted Slamniest Poet in the East Bay Express in 05. Yeah, very good. Makes sense. Makes sense. Up next, we have a man who uses humor to talk about a number of issues and to bring Africa to light with twists and paradoxes to bring you an Africa never known before. He works the word on in print, online, and in broadcasting. You may have seen some of his works on PBS and on New America Media. He also works as a comedian. You may have seen him in comedia comedic stages throughout the Bay Area, or you may have heard him on KLW's Africa Mix. We bring up Edwin Okongo. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Berkeley, I always get a mixed feeling coming over here in Berkeley. Yeah, because I went to graduate school up here dropped sixty thousand dollars and here i am <laughs> a year of unemployment thirty eight dollars in the bank yeah and living in oakland yeah i'm stuck i i, I sh wow man this place is uh, Makes me feel so good for, to be from Africa. <laughs> Man. Yeah, but I, I love it. I love it. I, I figure since we are in a very smart city, Berkeley, I tell this joke I thought about yesterday. I was like, I was actually, this happened. I was looking at the word dictionary in a dictionary. <laughs> And this is how dumb people are. I mean, you would think it would only be two words. This book. 
But he had like 600 words in describing it. It's really dumb, man. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, so I went um, to Berkeley. And um, I grew up in Kenya. And for you, those of you who don't know, that is the communist country where Obama comes from. <laughs> yeah. Don't you guys hate, like, they're talking about, is he, was he born here or in, in Kenya? Obama's got to be, like, the most unfortunate guy because you have two, two sets of people who love him so much they swear he's from Kenya. <laughs> and then you have another set of people. Well, I went to school up here in Berkeley, as I said, and um, when I was growing up in Kenya, true story, my mom would tell me, when you get out of that bathroom, I want you to be as clean as a white man. True story. And I would step out of gold, scrap myself, and come out, and mama would take a, the index finger and lick it with saliva and go on my chest and scrub it to, make, to test for, for dirt. Scrub it so hard until my a fire started on my chest <laughs> like that's what i mean you know? and then uh, i came to berkeley <laughs> have you been on telegraph haven't you oh my god i'm walking one day and you know i have no problem with anybody doing whatever the heck they want to do but don't try to be in my face telling me you know, hey, stop driving. Stop buying diamonds, blood diamonds. Save the children of Africa. I had this lady just walking out to me, and I was like, you want to save a ch an African child? Why don't you begin right here with this one standing in front of you? <laughs> Take a shower. <laughs> Change your clothes. And if that's not the ultimate screw you African kid, you are in a country where you can go to Goodwill for a dollar and come out with a closet, like a whole wardrobe of things, but you won't do it. If that's not the ultimate screw you African kid walking around barefoot, I don't know what is. Oh, we must be in Berkeley. They kept quiet a lot of it. <laughs> That's all good. But uh, I have a confession to make. I just recently became a U.S. citizen. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you why I did it, man. I didn't, I, I didn't do it. You know. I'll tell you why I did it. I did it because I know I'm trying to enhance my life, not financially, but I've given up on that part. <laughs> but... I know with an American passport, if I went to Kenya and got thrown in jail like I did the last time, Obama will send a Black Hawk, helicopter gunship, special forces to rescue me. <laughs> because my life as an American is worth more than my life when I was an African. All right? You don't believe me? Look at Ivory Coast. They don't care about that. My life is worth much, much less. Obama would not care if I'm abducted in the village where his grandmother lives. Because she is not an American. General Petraeus, get my cousin Edwin out of there. <laughs> Here, but Mr. President, that's where your grandmother lives. Level the village. She's not an American, is she? <laughs> <laughs> Granny be screaming, Obama, yawa! <laughs> die, Granny, die! <laughs> true, true. Oh, this is a, we're on free speech radio, babe, people. <laughs> oh, you're acting shocked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love, um, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, reunited with, uh, my, black brothers and sisters after after 400 years I know I cheated I flew here oh my God. but we are in this 
this together. We're in this together. And thank you, white people, for the ticket. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And um, I have a um, problem getting women. <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, American women, I've tried to find a girlfriend. American women, they want me to treat them nice. <laughs> Take them to the beach. Oh, baby, buy me some candlelight dinner. I'm like, hold on, baby. I'm from Africa. I had candlelight dinner every night for 20 years. <laughs> Can we go somewhere where there's electricity? Thank you, guys. My name is Edwin O'Kongo. Thank you very much for... Thank you, Edwin, very much. So how, how did you guys... Uh, how did you like it? Well, um, we'll do one more clap. If you really liked it... Thank you. So we've got a few minutes left, so we'll uh, ask Killing My Lobster to come up. We'll ask them a few questions. And Edwin. And Edwin as well. All right, Edwin, how did you get so funny? Yeah, so the question Life. was, Edwin, how did you get so funny? Uh, I mean, one of the things that people don't, when they see Africa, they're thinking about, you know, all this suffering. But we are really funny people. <laughs> We, when I'm hanging out with my friends, I'm not the funniest. They're really funny. So the difference is that I am standing up and, and, and telling these jokes for them. Some of the stories I hear from my friends who don't have the guts to stand up here and embarrass themselves. Is there any other questions from the audience? Oh, come on, make it easy for us. <laughs> One more question. When are you going to be appearing next? Edwin, when will you appear next? You know what? I don't know. Anybody listening out there, cops, uh, whatever. <laughs> I'm looking for work. I'm unemployed. Punchline. Yeah, Sarah, it's online. Well, the next show I have is in Santa Barbara on May, I mean, on the 22nd. And um, I need money before then, so call me up, people. <laughs> <laughs> Carmen, you had a question? Well, I wanted to ask Killing My Lobster, where where'd you guys get your name? How did that come about? Uh, I think it came up at, uh, a game. at a drunken party where yeah. someone was playing celebrity and uh, I don't yeah I don't know if you guys have ever heard that game celebrity, but um, <laughs> they each, uh, everyone Describe picks it. a picks a celebrity and you know it's kind of like charades where you have to like act out the the celebrity and you have to guess it and the person that the celebrity was Lauren Hill. And the person's like acting it out, and Paul, the founder of the company, is like, "Oh, she sings that song is killing my lobster." <laughs> and, that's, and the name was born. Yeah. And so, from killing me softly, is that what you meant to say? Yes. Oh. <laughs> so the sketch you did was from Killing My Lobster reboots, which is going to be at the Jewish Theater April seventh through twenty fourth. That's at 470 Florida, Florida Street at Mariposa in San Francisco. Yep. That's right. And I understand one of you is new to the team. Thanks. Oh, that's me. That's me. <laughs> oh. And this, you are? Uh, my name is Matt Gunnison, and I'm here with... Uh, thank you. I'm here with Allie Johnson and Todd Brotzi. And, and All right. <clears throat> thank we you. We also have uh, three more cast members uh, that are part of the show. Uh, Allison Page and Callum Grant, who is a Berkeley grad, and um, uh, Leslie Wagner. Fabulous. So thank you, all of you who performed tonight. You were all great. I laughed quite a bit. We're just at the time yeah. to wrap up the show. So today we heard Caitlin Gill, Killing My Lobster, and Edwin Okongo. Let's give them a round of applause. Yay. So, yes, we have come to the end of the show. So tune in next week to Full Circle at 7 p.m. on KPFA. Our website is kpfaapprentice.org. You can also check us out. Check out our last couple shows archived at kpfa.org slash full dash circle. Uh, yes, that was what well, <laughs> we had issues with that. But, yes, that's what it is. kpfa.org slash 
full dash circle. Anyways, special thanks to our production and technical interns from KPFA, Apprenticeship Program Group 35, Sunlo South, Sunlo Ongea. We are V-Star, Carmen, El Taino, Felix, Jen, Irene, Sam the Shaolin B-Boy, DJ Slim, and Taishi. Our executive producers are Miss M and Miss Renee. Our technical director is Free Wheelin' Franklin. Our in- <laughs> All right, we got some fans here. Our intro music is produced by Source of Labor, and our outro music is produced by B. Tandre. If you have questions, if you have any questions or topics for future shows, give us a call at 510-848-6767, extension 627, or send us an email to fullcircle at kpfa.org. We've been your hosts, Irene Ann.